Hello, my name is Hannah Montgomery, and today I will be sharing with you my capstone presentation. My capstone focuses on the use of apocalyptic rhetoric in eco-cinematic documentary film, and I specifically looked at the portrayal of climate crisis in the film Before the Flood. Let's get started. So for this paper, I decided that I would use apocalyptic rhetoric as my main theory. An apocalyptic rhetoric encourages an audience to take action to prevent environmental telos or end times. So originally apocalyptic rhetoric was more um, from a religious perspective. And because of that, it would uh, be used by writers to tell audiences what they need to do based on the authority of religious texts because the audience would have already had um, knowledge of that. Uh, within apocalyptic rhetoric, there's also the method of transfer, and I'll get into how ethos, pathos, and logos are all tied into that. Now, transfer is used by writers and filmmakers, and in this case, um, they use, like I said, the authority of religious texts, as well as religious leaders to help persuade the audience. Um, and they would like to persuade the audience to change, to make a decision in their lives to either prevent the oncoming apocalypse or to save themselves, save their families from the apocalypse. So apocalyptic rhetoric, as I said, uses the method of transfer. And in this case, it was coined as associated progression. So an argument is constructed based on relationships between different historical and current ideas and events. So what writers do or what filmmakers do in this case is they take an idea um, originally from a religious text, um, something that people believe in, that people have a knowledge of previously, and then they move throughout their argument to, to the next point, um, and again to another point to end with the persuasion of their audiences. So it's through this associated progression of ideas and topics where one thing is related to the next that writers are then able to persuade their audiences. Now they do this in three main ways. The first is borrowing authority, the second is predicting the future, and the third is con by constructing bipolar dramas. So I chose to look at eco-cinema, which is a genre of uh, film, and there are two forms of eco-cinema. The first one is a contemporary style, which encourages audiences to appreciate both ecosystems and organisms. This genre focuses more on the environmental relationship we have um, and caring for those species. And then it's a much more like ecocentric point of view. Whereas the activist side of it, um, the alternate form of eco cinema, it aims to inspire an audience um, and it aims to also help them become more educated and motivated to change aspects of their lives in order to help the environment. So I have decided, um, and I think you would agree, that the activist part of eco-cinema is much more um, prevalent in these types of films that I will be discussing, it's specifically before the flood, in that the filmmakers are trying to get the audience to move through their topics and ideas, like I said, with the associated progression, and have them make a change for humankind, for themselves. It's less so about, like, you know, we care so much about this small species, we must protect it at all costs, and more about, well, without this species, humankind would not be able to survive. Or without this species, you know, we would be so sad to see it go, and our family, our children would never be able to experience that type of connection with the species that we have now. So next, we're going to move into um, a few eco-cinematic films. The first one is An Inconvenient Truth, which is narrated by Al Gore, and I'll get more into that later. Second is Everything's Cool. And a couple more examples are found here. We have The Day After Tomorrow, which was not a documentary. It was actually an action film, but it did focus on an apocalyptic world happening. And The Last is Before the Flood, which is the documentary film that I chose to really analyze in this presentation. So, like I said, writers and filmmakers will use methods of persuasion um, in order to get their audiences to make a change in their lives. They want their audiences to make decisions that will prevent the further degradation of the planet, 
and they also want their audience to use their voice and power as voters to influence politics. Now, I found that this was um, a much more new idea than compared to older apocalyptic rhetoric, which was, like I said, based more on religion. Um, instead, it's kind of turning more into politics. What can people do that they have, you know, the power in their lives to make change? So that's what I found in this film. Now we're going to go into ethos, pathos, and logos, which are also used as methods of persuasion and help the filmmakers have a stronger connection with their audience. I would like you all to watch a short clip of the uh, preview for Before the Flood. We've known about this for decades, for over half a century. Try to have a conversation with anyone about climate change, people just do now. Climate change, climate change, climate change. The problem seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. The truth is, the more I've learned about this issue and everything that contributes to the problem, the more I realize how much I don't know. Look at how violent that is. Paradise that has been degraded and destroyed. We're knowingly doing this. I just want to know how far we've gone and if there's anything we can do to stop it. So that's kind of like an in, a little bit of an intro to the film if, you, if you've never seen Before the Flood. So next we're going to move on to um, ethos. As I said before, ethos is one of the ways that filmmakers have a stronger connection with their audience um, and helps them within their persuasion. So uh, I noticed that uh, narrators were used in eco cinematic film, and these types of narrators are encouraged to be likable, credible, trustworthy, someone that the audience is already very familiar with. And so we see that later on with Al Gore and Leonardo DiCaprio. These narrators are also integral to the effectiveness, effectiveness of the film, as they are able to communicate the science of climate change in more layman's terms. And so they can kind of translate with their interviews with scientists, okay, what's really happening here? Um, what would the average person have an understanding of or be able to grasp? So here we have Al Gore on the left. Um, he was the former vice president of the United States and also a climate activist and he narrated An Inconvenient Truth. And on the right we have Leonardo DiCaprio who is the UN messenger of peace and also an award-winning actor. And he is the narrator for Before the Flood. So I noticed while watching this film, The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch is often referenced um, throughout the film, very strongly in the beginning and very strongly in the end. And the way that we kind of have a connection with Leo is through the filmmakers um, using him as a narrator uh, to get us to kind of feel for him. Leo describes how this uh, painting was hung above his bed as a child and it, he was very familiar um, with the various frames within the image. And so he goes into explaining um, what each of these aspects of the painting mean, which kind of translates later on into what could the future look like for Earth. So we're going to watch that now. Paradise that has been degraded and destroyed. 
So Leo kind of used this iconography as a way to describe what the future could look like for Earth if we don't make changes now. Another method of persuasion used within apocalyptic rhetoric is through borrowing authority. We see this in Before the Flood a couple of times. One of those times is with Pope Francis. Um, Leo goes to visit with him and talks with him about his encyclical letter to um, the general public. And like I said before, um, having strong, credible narrators really helps the audience uh, stay convinced that this is important um, and something that is worth listening to and watching. So with borrowing authority, it may be used either religiously or politically. We'll see both of these examples um, and also provides stronger reasoning for action. If our authorities, if those that we hold as the higher status are saying that this is important, that we should listen, it's going to make the audience um, more likely to pay attention to what the filmmakers are portraying. So we'll move into Leo's interview with uh, former President Barack Obama, who Leo describes as the leader of the free world, one of our authorities, and which the filmmakers borrow authority from. You are the leader of the free world. You have access to information that most people do not. What makes you terrified for the future? Uh, a huge portion of the world's population lives near oceans. Mm -hmm. If they start moving, then you start seeing uh, scarce resources, the subject of competition between populations. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why the Pentagon has said this is a national security issue. This isn't just an environmental issue. This is a national security issue. So this is a case of borrowing authority in which they're using more politics uh, side of it. And President Barack Obama describes how climate change is not just something that we should worry about because of the loss of species. Yes, he agrees that that's incredibly important, but he also says that climate change is a direct threat to national security. With the migration of different um, people who are fleeing different zones, say there was a drought in one area never seen before, having to migrate. These kinds of issues are a national security threat in the eyes of our political leader here. Pathos is also very integral to the relationship with the audience, with the ability to both internalize the consequences of climate change um, and kind of prove that inaction is not what should be done, that just losing hope um, is not going to save us. Pathos is also central to the audience's understanding of climate science, and it moves the emotions in the audience from just caring for themselves to also caring for their humans, for other wildlife, and lastly, most importantly, for the planet, because without the planet, humans wouldn't even survive, as we all know. So we see an example of pathos used by the filmmakers with their interview with Sunita Nareen. Um, she is the Director General of the Center for Science and Environment in India, and she sits down with Leo and describes how um, different types of fuel can be used by the poor in India, and also the consequences of not moving towards a more sustainable source of fuel. Coal is cheap, whether you and I like it or not, coal is cheap. You have to think about this from this point of view. If you created the problem in the past, we will create it in the future. We have 700 million households who cook using biomass today, 700 million households. If those households move to coal, you have that much more use of fossil fuel. Then the entire world is fried. If anyone gives you this very cute stuff and tells you, oh, the world's poor should move to solar, and why do they have to make the mistakes that we have made? I hear this all the time right. from American NGOs. And I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, if it was that easy, I would have really liked the US to move towards solar, but you haven't. Let's put our money where our mouth is. 
Lastly, logos is another aspect of persuasion used by the filmmakers, and they utilize it to kind of describe the anger and the disappointment of scientific, political, economic experts within the film. And each of these experts point towards causes of climate change, where that's, um, you know, giving subsidies to fuel companies or um, not like, like Noreen said, not having um, sustainable sources of fuel um, and other issues, it kind of um, makes the audience pay attention to what the experts are saying. Logos is also used um, to persuade through reasoning and evidence, um, and it assists the documentary in communicating the important causes of climate change. Apocalyptic rhetoric uh, uses many different methods, as I said before, and one of these is constructing popular dramas. Originally, this was more a good versus evil, uh, God versus Satan, um, and but in this case, in a more um, contemporary world, we have the construction of the people who are trying to save the planet um, and prevent further climate issues and those who are exacerbating those issues like fossil fuel companies. So these bipolar dramas tell the audience um, to do more than just what is good. It gives them the opportunity to use their own power as voters to make change. It also encourages the audience to be opposed to the more evil group, like I said, the fossil fuel companies. Um, and these companies try to further degrade the climate and end up speeding up the effects of global catastrophes um, when they do so. This image that you see here is from an interview where Leonardo DiCaprio travels to the Sumatran rainforest and learns about palm oil plantations. He is talking here um, with some experts in the field about what would be the further consequences of this, and that would be a complete loss of biodiversity in the area. Another um, example of constructing bipolar dramas is when Leo is on a helicopter ride and he's looking over these uh, tar sands in Canada. And here in these tar sands, they've completely decimated a boreal forest to be able to sift through the sand and collect tar. And we see the evidence of constructing a bipolar drama here when Leo kind of describes that this looks like Mordor. This looks evil. Let's watch it now. So those are all, all the black oil sands. Yeah, you can tell by looking at it that it is oil in it. So what happens in real time is we take the sandy oil and we wash the oil out of the sand. We just pump steam into the ground and then as the ground warms, literally the oil drops. It just falls out of the sand and then we're done. Kind of looks like uh, Mordor. What? Mordor from Lord of the Rings. Such a massive operation. I'm blown. And another method used within apocalyptic rhetoric to transfer our um, audience's ideas from one point to the next is through predicting the future. Now, by predicting the future, the filmmakers are encouraging audiences to take ad. ad sorry, to take action. Urgency and collective power within the audience is very um, visible in this film, as well as the fear of the apocalypse. However, the filmmakers try to reassure the viewers that mitigating global warming is possible if changes are made. In this image here, we have Leo talking to a NASA scientist, and they are describing how in the future, this is what satellites project to be global temperatures and this is just like I said another example of um, predicting the future and kind of seeing well what could happen what is the future for us if we don't do something now. Lastly I'd like to have you all watch Leonardo DiCaprio's ending speech at the signing of the Paris Agreement in New York City and he is talking here to world leaders but he's also kind of calling out to those who are watching um, about what what's going to happen if things don't change now. 
After 21 years of debate and conferences, it is time to declare no more talk, no more excuses, no more 10-year studies, no more allowing the fossil fuel companies to manipulate and dictate the science and policies that affect our future. The world is now watching. You will either be lauded by future generations or vilified by them. You are the last best hope of Earth. We ask you to protect it. Are we and all living things we cherish our history? That was a very strong speech by Leo that the filmmakers decided to put within the film. And I'd like to conclude now with how apocalyptic rhetoric was used. So filmmakers encourage audiences to change their lifestyles and ask them to call for political action to be taken in order to prevent uh, further apocalyptic events, further climate degradation, or you could say further environmental telos like end times. This is accomplished through the method of transfer in which the filmmakers use construction of bipolar dramas, borrowing authority and predicting the future to sway audiences towards their prediction and their position. Thank you so much for attending my senior capstone for communications and I really appreciate um, your viewing. Thank you. <laughs>